Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, What to Know About Hydrogen Safety Challenges and Mitigation Strategies, presented by Peter Dykow. Baker Risk has decades of experience completing incident investigations, loss prevention studies, testing and research, and risk management services. Today, we are excited to discover evaluation of hazards in the hydrogen economy and risk assessments, insights on hydrogen testing performed by Baker Risk experts, and industry outlook for hydrogen. Now, for today's webinar, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. First, we have posted links in the chat to content related to our webinar subject. We invite you to explore Baker Risk's published papers, previous webinars, and Baker Risk Training Center courses. Second, we want to respond to your questions following this webinar, so please type questions into the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel, and our presenters will respond to the questions. Finally, at the close of our webinar today, please provide feedback by responding to our survey. And now for the webinar, this presentation will focus on crucial insights on safety and risk challenges specific to the hydrogen industry and how to mitigate them. Baker Risk presenter Peter Dykow is a senior consultant in our Blast Effects Department at our Canada location. He is a Baker Risk service matter expert in hydrogen testing and research, performing risk assessments, and design basis modeling. Peter is also involved in the Compressed Gas Association Hydrogen Technology Committee, as well as the Center for Hydrogen Safety, and is active on multiple working groups related to hydrogen safety. We're excited to have Peter present this afternoon. So without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Peter. Thanks, Naomi. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today talking about hydrogen safety. Uh, there's a lot to go over in our short one hour window. So I'm just gonna dive right in uh, with our overview. So the real goal of today is to cover the content that uh, we presented in our seven paper white paper series on hydrogen. So we've kind of condensed that, that seven papers worth of material into a one hour uh, presentation that we're gonna try to go through and hit the high points throughout the, uh, throughout the next hour. So we'll start off with a little bit of a background, just give you a sense of, okay, where are we coming from and where's hydrogen and where is it going? And then we'll get into technical information. So there's a whole portion around infrastructure and equipment related hazards that comes from two of our white papers, which are material compatibility and high pressure hazards. And then we'll get into some of the work that Bakerisk has been doing in the testing and research front. So I know there's a lot of cool videos that Bakerisk has done over the years, and so we'll, we'll present some of those today. Um, the next section, assessing hazard and mitigation and risk, that's really what I think of as the meat and potatoes of the content. You know, how do you quantify um, hazards from a, both a qualitative standpoint and a quantitative standpoint? And once you understand those hazards and that risk, you know, how do you help mitigate those risks? And then we're gonna wrap things up with uh, a hydrogen industry outlook. So that's just Baker Risk's take on where, where the hydrogen economy is going in the, in the near future. So we'll start out with why hydrogen and why now? So across the world, we're seeing these uh, net zero mandates come into play. Uh, some of them are being imposed by governments, others are corporate uh, mandates that are coming into play, but regardless, uh, we're seeing the shift towards needing to be carbon zero, carbon neutral, um, net zero, low carbon, carbon free. There's a whole bunch of different terms that you could go uh, and use, but at the end of the day is reducing uh, CO2 production. And so as we go through this transition within the uh, you know, uh, energy marketplace, other types of technology are going to have to take the place of traditional hydrocarbons. And so if you look at the, the right-hand side of the screen here, I have a, of a plot that shows um, basically energy storage. And so on the x-axis, you have power. And on the y-axis, you have the amount of time that you might be storing that energy. And so this gives you a really good high-level uh, view of why chemicals you know, are so useful to us in our modern economy. You know, chemical storage is really good at storing a range of, uh, of energy. Um, and you can store it for long periods of time. So it's a, it's a really you know, advantageous situation to be able to store various amounts of energy for long periods of time. And you can also you know, ship chemical energy around you know, pretty efficiently. You can, you can have pipelines that move that energy, those energy carriers around the, uh, a region or a country or, or around the world. 
Uh, other types of energy storage are a little bit harder to, to move around. So for example, if you think of the Hoover Dam, you can't really move the Hoover Dam around the country. And the, to transfer the energy from that you know, stored potential energy, you typically convert it to electricity and then send the electricity somewhere else. Whereas chemical energy, you can directly carry the, the energy carriers around. Now, hydrogen is looking like a preferred feedstock to be able to provide the advantages of chemical storage while also being a low carbon or carbon free um, energy carrier. So, so that's why hydrogen is looking like a really good option for uh, these locations where we need to start removing hydrocarbons out of our energy mix. Some of the derivatives of hydrogen, such as ammonia and methanol, are also really interesting um, options for, for low carbon, no carbon uh, energy carriers. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. But really at the end of the day, uh, we're seeing that we need to find options to be able to get energy to where it needs to be. And hydrogen seems to be a player in that, in that mix. So if we look at you know, hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol, these three are uh, energy carriers that could be um, basically low carbon or no carbon. Now, none of them are, are the golden ticket. None of them are perfect. So it's really about selecting, you know, what is your energy carrier of choice for your specific uh, situation? So on the, on the right-hand side of the screen here, you'll see a plot showing energy density. So on the x-axis, we're talking about mass energy density. So how much energy is there per unit weight? And then on the y-axis, this is volumetric energy density. So how much energy is there in a certain volume? And if you think about in an ideal world, an ideal energy carrier, in the top right here, you have the, the perfect energy carrier. It has a lot of energy for a very small uh, mass and a lot of energy for a very small volume. Unfortunately, that, that doesn't exist right now. You have your traditional fuels over here, and then down here is where we have hydrogen. And so you can see hydrogen has a really high energy density from a mass standpoint. So in applications where the mass of your, your energy carrier is important, hydrogen's a great option. You know, think about a rocket ship going up to space. You know, the, the payload is really, uh, the mass of the payload is very uh, sensitive. So hydrogen's a great fuel for, as, as, as a rocket fuel. You know, hydrogen, oxygen, and your rocket goes up into space. But in cases where you need, um, where, where you're very volumetrically sensitive, where you want a lot of energy in a small volume, Hydrogen isn't as advantageous. You can see that down here, it's you know quite a bit lower on the y-axis compared to things like methane, you know your propanes, um, and then your liquid fuels like your traditionals, gasolines, diesels, petrols. You know it has a significant disadvantage. So when we think about you know where can hydrogen really fit into the energy mix in, in the future, it really comes down to what what is the uh, what is the need and does it fit the, the bill properly? And so that's where ammonia and methanol come in as, as options. Basically, uh, ammonia and methanol on this plot fall in this region here. So the idea is that with those two carriers, you're giving up the, uh, the benefits of having that you know, uh, energy density on a mass basis because you've you know, shifted towards the left, but you've gone upwards. And so in cases where you know, volumetric energy density is more, more important, um, ammonia and methanol could be good options as, as energy carriers that are derived from hydrogen, and therefore they could be uh, carbon neutral or, or, or net zero. So from a, from a high level um, hydrogen economy standpoint, really the kind of the key takeaways is that we're seeing net zero mandates come into play, and that's going to shift the energy market over the next you know, 20, 30, 40 years. A lot of the net zero mandates are 2030, 2035, 2050. And so you need technologies that can get you to those mandates within that time frame. And hydrogen is seeming to be a good option in that case. There's definitely not, uh, not a reason to use hydrogen in every single application, but there's definitely applications where hydrogen makes a lot of sense because of its intrinsic properties. And so that's what we're seeing. Now, I'm going to talk next about infrastructure and equipment related hazards. So this is taken from, from two of our white papers, uh, namely the, the material compatibility white paper and then the equipment uh, high pressure hazards white paper. So we'll start out with the uh, comparisons of hydrogen related damage mechanisms. So this is a material compatibility paper uh, authored by Dr. Sean Berg. It did a really great in-depth view of different um, 
material damage mechanisms that, that are specific to hydrogen. And so the, the paper really goes in depth in all of them, so I'm not gonna really dive into it, but I did wanna highlight a couple um, uh, here in this table. So you can see uh, we've listed out hydrogen embrittlement, induced uh, hydrogen induced cracking, stress oriented hydrogen induced cracking, as well as high temperature hydrogen attack. Um, I think that a lot of people have heard of hydrogen embrittlement and high, uh, temp high temperature hydrogen attack, but the other two might be a little bit less well known. So those are really good ones to cover in the white paper and to read about. But I also wanted to talk about, you know, one in depth that I found pretty interesting, which is the high temperature hydrogen attack. And that one's pretty interesting because unlike the hydrogen embrittlement, it's uh, mainly going to be uh, occurring at, uh, at higher temperatures and higher pressures. So if we look at the, the next slide here, you know, what is high temperature hydrogen attack? So it's really uh, occurring when hydrogen is ingressing and reacting with the metal. And basically you get um, your dissolved carbon and your metal carbides are reacting with that, with that hydrogen and you end up forming metal gas within that metal. So if you, if you look at the, the right-hand side of the screen here, we have an example of, of hydrogen. Basically it's being pushed into the material. You know, it's very high temperature and very um, high pressure. So that's where your high temperature hydrogen attack happens. It's not at operating conditions that are, that are lower, but at those higher operating pressures and temperatures, the hydrogen is really being forced into, into the metal. And as it goes in, you get reactions. You can decarburization, but you can get it without decarb. And basically as it reacts, you see the methane, you know, uh, forming little pockets and then it's causing pressure and then it's developing these, these fissures. And as you develop the fissures, the strength of the steel degrades uh, and you can end up with potentially sudden, you know, and brittle uh, failure. And so that's, that's when you start to worry, you know. Um, we, this whole seminar is, is around uh, different types of hazards. And when you have material compatibility issues that could lead to, you know, sudden brittle, brittle failure, that's when you start to see, you know, hazards. So one of those hazards is going to be um, basically the, the, the hazards associated with, with the failure, uh, sudden failure of a system. So the, one of the slides, uh, or excuse me, one of the, uh, the white papers that we published was on the high pressure hydrogen hazards. And so this really comes about when you have those high pressure systems that we were just talking about in the last slide. And when you have sudden failure, you can get a whole number of hazards. So you can get projectiles. So that would be, you know, uh, pieces of the equipment uh, becoming projectile hazards. You can have blast waves, even without ignition of the, of the hydrogen. Basically, when you have the pressure, the, the system at a high pressure, uh, the release of that, that uh, high pressure material can result in pressure waves, blast waves, shock waves that can damage people, equipment, uh, buildings. So it poses a real hazard. And then also you can get cable whipping. So pipe whipping um, is when basically the, the forces associated with that high pressure jet, uh, gas jetting is gonna cause motion of the equipment, which can then injure people. So you really have to start to think about these different types of hazards that, that manifest maybe as a result of material compatibility issues. And so we'll talk about the flammability hazards of hydrogen later, but this is a really interesting paper and topic to me because you get hazards that you may not have considered because uh, if you're focused on the, the flammability aspect, you, know, you might be missing other hazards such as high pressure hazards. And so when you're developing and designing your systems, you, you should take into account these other types of hazards. And so there's a couple regulations that I've shown here uh, that, are, that are good references. Uh, but I think what you all might be interested in is seeing a couple videos of what these hazards look like from a testing standpoint. So I'm going to pause this real quick. So this is a test um, uh, facility that Baker Risk runs, uh, owns and operates. And what you're going to see here is that you have a high pressure hydrogen system. On the left hand side of the screen, you have a, a straight steel pipe, and then you have a coupling, and then you have a flexible uh, uh, pipe. So in this, uh, in this location, you actually see that the flexible pipe is bolted to the concrete um, and strapped down. So what the test video is going to show is actually a failure at this location at this end where you have high pressure gas being released which then results in a failure of the um of the of the strapping down and then a 
uh, and then a hazard due to uh, pipe whipping. And I'm going to let that uh, play one more time for you so, so you get a sense. So again, failures at this end, the, the connection between the hard pipe and the, the flexible pipe is here, and you have connections along this pipe there. How that could, you could see how that could really be a hazard to somebody standing in that area. So it's something to be aware of. The next video I'm going to show is an example of the uh, projectile hazards associated with high pressure systems. So here you have uh, a high pressure hydrogen system with uh, a material plug here that ends up with a brittle sudden failure. And the, the result of that is actually getting a projectile hazard that launches towards the steel plate. This steel plate here is to stop it, but you'll see uh, how, how effective that steel plate is at stopping that projectile hazard. So you can see that there's a hole that just rips right through and that steel slug launches right through the, the steel plate. I'll play it again for you. So as I mentioned, it's really important to understand that high pressure systems pose hazards beyond flammability when it comes to hydrogen. And so really quantifying and understanding those hazards is important during the design phase of your projects. So uh, there's a couple different uh, tools and, and methods to do that. I wanted to highlight two on this slide here. So you can see on the left-hand side uh, of the screen shows a, a finite element analysis model that, that we developed for, for such a project. Um, so the idea is using FEA to look at the, the forces and the stress and strain that results of an accidental release or sudden failure. And then you can also evaluate the blast loads associated with, with these types of uh, systems. So, on the left hand on the left hand side here you can see a CFD or computational fluid dynamics model that we developed for a case and that lets you under better understand the blast consequences associated with that that sudden release of, of high pressure gas and how that blast and pressure wave may, may propagate so when you're looking at mitigating the risk from from hydrogen uh, high pressure hydrogen systems you have a variety of options there's a, a few here on this slide that I wanted to touch on just real quick so you get a sense of kind of what's out there. Um, on the far left here, portable screens. So you can obviously design portable screens to be able to take the impact of, of a fragment. So projectile hazards, you can protect against those if you, you know, use the right materials and uh, you have the right thickness. The one thing that uh, portable screens don't really protect against is the, the overpressure or the blast hazard. And so if you think of a pressure wave or a shock wave similar to a sound wave, you know that a sound wave can wrap around objects. You know, if you put your hand in front of your mouth, people can probably still hear you and you can hear other people talking to you because that wave wraps around and wraps over. And so screens are great options for when you're just trying to mitigate against projectile hazards. If you're looking to protect against blast hazards as well, you can use uh, enclosures. So here's an example of a shock and fragment enclosure. We call it SAFE here at Baker Risk. And this is where you would place a high pressure system inside of the SAFE in order to make sure that people on the outside are safe. So if you think about this, if you have a sudden failure, uh, whether that uh, results in a, in a blast wave or a fragment throw, uh, the safe enclosure basically can, can keep the, the hazards inside and protect the people from the outside. Additionally, if you're worried about cable whip, you can design uh, tethers to make sure that you can minimize the, the impact of such, a, such an event. Now, the key here is to engineer those tethers to be able to take the forces. Uh, we've done lots of tests in the past with you know, both high pressure systems as well as uh, explosion systems that uh, are related to tethering systems. And so making sure that your tethers are able to take the forces to actually provide the mitigation to the hazard is really important. So the next section is going to talk about uh, testing that Baker Risk has done. So some more interesting test videos for everybody. I'm sure you're all going to enjoy. Uh, but this slide here shows a, a quick overview of the work that Baker Risk has been involved in from a testing standpoint for hydrogen um, over the last uh, number of years. 
So you can see that from the pictures, there's been a variety of uh, types of testing we've done. So we've been involved in lab scale testing. We've done field scale dispersion and ignition testing. We've also run a lot of explosion testing. So both unconfined outdoor vapor cloud explosion testing for hydrogen and air, as well as confined vented explosion testing. So unconfined outdoor, you can think of a, a process area related to hydrogen. Uh, confined and enclosed, you can think of a process building, a process enclosure, a single module. Um, we've evaluated both when it comes to, to explosions. And so this presentation over the next couple of slides, I'm going to focus on the outdoor vapor cloud explosion testing that we've done. But as you can see, we've been involved in a lot over the years. And so I'd be happy to talk about other types of testing we've done um, at a later date. Now, first off, why should you care? Um, I think there's some uh, misnomers out there in, in the industry that uh, hydrogen can't pose a, a vapor cloud explosion hazard outside because hydrogen just disperses up into the air and, and disappears. Uh, well, although hydrogen is very buoyant, uh, typically hydrogen systems are going to be running at some sort of pressure. And when you have a system at pressure, um, basically, you when you have a potential release, uh, you can have uh, a dispersion that's going to be momentum driven initially. So if you think of a high pressure system, you get a small leak or even a large leak, you're going to have a lot of force momentum that's driving that, that hydrogen gas outwards. And if you assume a, a horizontal release, that momentum is going to dominate the dispersion. So you end up with a big cloud at ground level. Um, before the buoyancy takes over. Eventually, you know, as momentum forces dissipate, the cloud will, will, will drift away, but you have a large portion of flammable material that's at grade. And so when you have that, if it ignites, it can pose a severe uh, vapor cloud explosion hazard. And so here's some examples of uh, a computational fluid dynamics model that we ran to, to basically just demonstrate this to, uh, to people in industry. Uh, you have a 3D isometric view here, you have a plan view here, and an elevation view here. Uh, the, the scale in terms of the hydrogen concentration is shown uh, along here. And what this is, is basically a hydrogen module where you have an accidental release. And you can see that um, from, from any of these views, initially you have this really you know, strong momentum-driven phase for the dispersion, and you have high concentrations of hydrogen at grade. And then eventually you, buoyancy does take over and lifts off. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, you, can, you have to understand that there is that potential for high concentrations of hydrogen in a region where uh, if you get ignition, you can result in a vapor cloud explosion. And so better understanding this phenomenon has been a big driver for Bakeris testing over the years. So the first test video I'm going to show you is going to be a hydrogen air uh, vapor cloud explosion test. So if you look at this test rig, uh, it is 48 feet long and 6 feet tall and 12 feet deep. It's a mixture of hydrogen and air, a 22% hydrogen. So if you think about the worst case for hydrogen, it's going to be near stoichiometric around 30%. So this is only 22%. So this is not worst case. Uh, this is fuel lean. And so we wanted to better understand, you know, at a case that's not the worst case situation, you know, what type of explosion pressures uh, are we going to be able to develop? What are we going to be able to see? And so what you're going to see is you're going to see ignition at the center of the rig, and the flame is going to propagate outwards to the edges of the rig, and it's going to accelerate, and that's what produces that pressure wave that can damage uh, equipment, buildings, and, and potentially injure people. I'm going to pause it, and I'm going to play it again for you. I should have given you a heads up that it, uh, it's probably going to be pretty loud on your speakers, uh, but I'll play it again one more time for you so you get a sense, because it's pretty fast. So one of the things we really wanted to understand with these tests was, well, how does the uh, vapor cloud explosion change as the concentration of hydrogen changes? Because you saw from the, the CFD images that I showed you, there's definitely a concentration gradient. So the concentration of hydrogen changes in a real release from where the release occurs all the way out till basically you get beyond the lower flammability limit. So what portion of that cloud actually contributes to the, to the explosion? 
So we have run a whole number of tests at different concentrations. And so this test is going to show uh, the same thing as you saw in the last video, except it's at 14% con uh, concentration. So we're even leaner. There's less hydrogen in the rig. And we've gone to a much longer rig. So this is, you know, for scale, this now is a 100-foot long rig. And you're going to, again, see ignition and that, that flame propagate outwards. And so you'll want to focus on the left-hand side of the rig because in this test, we didn't ignite directly at center. We kind of ignited a little bit further to the right. So you'll see a lot more run-up distance to this edge of the rig on the left here. And so I'll let that loop one more time for you guys. Uh, so again, this is this is not a worst case. This is this is significantly lean. This is only 14% hydrogen. So at 14%, we still saw damaging overpressures being developed. So the next step was to go down even lower in concentration, 12%. You know, at what point does the hydrogen that's in the flammable cloud no longer contribute to the vapor cloud explosion. And so that's the question we're trying to answer. So again, this is the identical rig, but we've gone just a little bit leaner, lower in concentration for hydrogen. We're down at 12%. <laughs> And I'll let that one loop again for you. But this one's really interesting to me because we've only changed the concentration by 2%, but suddenly you're not really hearing a big bang. You're getting like a whoosh sound. And from our instrumentation, we didn't measure damaging overpressures being developed. This is really more representative of a flash fire. You know, if you think of an explosion, you think of pressure that develops that can injure a person, uh, damage buildings, equipment, etc. Flash fires are really just hazards for the, if from a person's standpoint, if you're actually in the flammable cloud, you're not really going to, um, you're not going to generate any pressure. The, the damage to yourself or a person is going to be from, from the fire burning. And so this is really interesting because you're seeing this transition from what is an explosion to basically a flash fire. So I'll play it again. So now that we've talked about uh, the different hazards that, that exist with hydrogen, both, you know, non- uh, not related to ignition and related to ignition, we're going to get into what I think is really important is assessing the hydrogen hazards and helping to mitigate the risk. So we published two white papers associated with this kind of topic. One is focuses on the qualitative side of, of hazard and risk, and the other is quantitative. So if we focus initially on the, the qualitative approach, what did we want to achieve with this paper? Well, we really wanted people to better understand the regulatory framework for hydrogen systems and describe why someone should conduct a PHA and, and how to do that. So we do provide a, an example of a PHA for a hydrogen electrolyzer in the white paper. Um, we won't go in depth on that today, uh, but the whole idea of the white paper and, and this presentation for this section is to highlight some of the key nuances with a PHA and why it's important. And so I mentioned in this bullet here regarding PSM. So um, for those of you that are outside the US, I know there's a lot of you that aren't inside the in the US uh, right now, uh, PSM or process safety management is regulated in the US for facilities that have over a threshold limit of uh, hazardous chemicals. So in the US that and for hydrogen, that threshold is, is 10,000 pounds. So you can see how there could be lots of facilities out there that, that are below that 10,000 pound threshold but it might be a good idea to still do PHAs, even though they're not uh, mandated by regulation. So this gets into the idea that uh, you should always, you know, meet the very minimum, which is, you know, regulatory requirements. But then in what cases should you go beyond that minimum regulatory requirement to better understand your hazards? And so PHAs are a good example of that for facilities that might not technically be covered by, by PSM. Because if you think about hydrogen in its gaseous form, you can have a lot of hydrogen on site in, in, in gas storage before you hit that, that 10,000 pounds. With, with liquid uh, hydrogen, it's a little bit easier. You know, a couple tanks can, can get you above that 10,000 pounds. Uh, but just again, because hydrogen vapor is so, uh, so light and, and not very dense, um, 
you could have facilities that could easily have a lot of storage without tr triggering that PSM regulation. Um, and if you don't have PSM regulation in, in your region, there may be reasons to do PHAs beyond that. So regulatory framework. Um, so as many of you know, I'm sure there's multiple global standards and guidelines that need to be followed. Uh, it's a little bit of a patchwork um, out there nowadays because the hydrogen industry is growing so quickly. Um, sometimes uh, code standards and regulations lag behind technology uh, a a adaption. Um, and so that's really important to, to understand. Now, if you, you for your specific geographic location, you'll need to determine which standards apply for your site and then com conduct compliance evaluation and analysis accordingly. So our paper uh, does provide a, a, a list of common regulations, codes, and standards that are used around the globe, but by no means is it an exhaustive list. Uh, so you always have to make sure that you're following your pertinent local regulations, um, and you should investig investigate that on a case-by-case -case basis. There's also a uh, something to be said about making sure facilities are consistent, because whether you're within a single country and you have uh, facilities that are in different jurisdictions, uh, specifically, you know, for example, in the U.S., you might uh, have different requirements moving state to state. Um, and it, definitely, if you're a global organization and you have facilities in North America and Europe, uh, Australia and Asia, um, as you go through uh, these different regions, you may have completely different, you know, levels of regulation and requirements to develop, a, uh, to be able to commission your facility. But that brings into the, into question, if you have, you know, a facility, you know, at some level of risk because of regulatory requirements, you know, does it make sense for other facilities that you own and operate to be at a completely different risk level uh, just because of you're meeting the, the minimum requirements in each country? So I, I definitely, you know, I think that the regulatory requirements are a minimum and then making sure you have consistency is, is, is definitely an important thing to consider. So I'm just going to touch on really quickly uh, the idea of the, the example PHA that we, we put into the white paper, um, and that was around an electrolyzer specifically. And one of the key factors that we talk about is that the need to define the scope of a PHA. So whether it's equipment that's off the shelf or whether you're, you're developing your own uh, systems for, for hydrogen, you know, defining the boundaries of that PHA and what's included and what's not is really important step to make sure that you're not missing potential hazards. So for example, for electrolyzers, the utilities are an important part of your, your PHA process. Um, I think that we've seen incidents and there's been a lot of discussion in industry about potential for cross-contamination of hydrogen and oxygen in the utility lines, depending on how your systems are, are piped together, um, because there could be migration from one portion of the system to the other. And so making sure that you're defining these boundaries at the early stage of the PHA is really important so you don't miss any hazards. Now, the other way to uh, assess hazards and then mitigate risk that we're going to touch on in this presentation is facility siting. So really, you're trying to objectively evaluate hazards associated with the operation of a hydrogen facility and the associated impacts on the receptors of interest. Now, when I say receptor of interest, you know, there's a variety of options. You know, that could be personnel, whether they're inside the facility or outside the facility. Uh, it could be buildings, again, on-site, off-site. It could be equipment. So the uh, facility siting and risk analysis can be used for a variety of receptors. And the variety and the receptor that you're evaluating really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to accomplish compliance with a specific regulation? Um, or are you trying to keep people safe? You know, what, what, are, what are you trying to do? We're all trying to keep people safe, but, but at the end of the day, it's a really strong tool and it comes down to, you know, what, what are you most interested in and, and what are you trying to achieve? But at the end of the day, facility siting and risk analysis really gives you, you know, numerical estimates to help you understand your risk exposures. And that should help you prioritize and give you guidance on how to mitigate the associated risk. And so you can use um, toler uh, tolerance criteria to basically determine whether you have to do anything or not. 
So uh, I highly encourage organizations to develop their own internal uh, tol risk tolerance criteria, but there are risk tolerance criteria that are out there publicly available that, that can be referenced. Um, so you can see, okay, where, where does my site and my facility, my operation fall against that, those typical uh, tolerance criteria thresholds? And then, you know, is the low risk is the risk low, excuse me, and do you have to not do anything? Um, is Do I need to demonstrate that risk is as low as reasonably practical? Is it, you know, in that ALARP region? Or is risk high and, and you know, mitigation is required? Those are kind of some of the key outputs that you should be getting out of a, a facility siting and risk analysis. And you can see that I've listed out some different standards and regulations that are, you know, global. Um, so, these are different, you know, I think uh, we've got, you know, the US with, with OSHA, we've got Canada with the process safety management. Um, we've got uh, the bottom two control of uh, major accident has hazards and then SEVOS three from Europe. So depending on what your local regulation is, uh, that might determine what, what your uh, receptors of interest are. So for example, you know, meeting the requirements of PSM in the US, you need to evaluate risk to your onsite personnel. Uh, but for, for Canada, maybe you're looking at offsite receptors to, to evaluate, you know, land planning management. So, so it really depends on what, you, what your goal is, but it's a really powerful tool. Now, if we look at some of the outputs of a, of a consequence and risk analysis, these are some contours that Baker has developed for a fictitious hydrogen facility. And, and you can see that some of the outputs can be thermal radiation contours from the jet fire hazards of a hydrogen release, you know, your flammable dispersion contours, so the maximum extents of a flammable release of hydrogen, and then the overpressure contours or blast contours you can get from an from a, a accidental vapor cloud explosion from a hydrogen release. So these are really good for emergency planning purposes. Again, if you're doing a risk analysis, you're probably going to make your decisions based off of the numerical values that you receive. But when it comes to uh, consequence contours, you can really do a lot of emergency planning and you can feed this information to other types of studies. So for example, if you know the blast loads on a building with critical equipment in it, you know, you can evaluate whether that equipment is gonna be operational post event. So if you have a vapor cloud explosion, the building that houses your, your fire water pumps that will be required to fight the fire post event, you know, are those still gonna be operational? So these are other things that can be looked at and evaluated from a consequence standpoint. Now, when it comes to risk mitigation, you really wanna focus on the numerical values that come out of a, out of a facility siting study. So I've shown here a couple different ways to look at risk. So the first one I'll highlight is a building location societal risk. So this is really focusing on where is risk being incurred. So these are either pro uh, buildings where people are spending time or outdoor process areas where people are working. And you can get estimates of the, of the risk to, to the people at those locations. And then if you look at the percentage of each, uh, of each location, you know, how much risk is it contributing to your overall site risk, that really lets you focus in on, on where you should be focusing your mitigation. So you can see at this example, you know, if you have a loading station where you're doing hydrogen loading and you're having operators stay in that location, in this fictitious example, there's a lot of risk being there. So you should probably focus your attention on the people in that building as opposed to a process area that has very, very low risk in comparison to the total risk. So that's one way to look at risk. Another way is to look at where the risk is coming from. So, so what operations or equipment are contributing the most risk to the site? And so that lets you look at risk in a different way for different mitigation strategies. Are there ways that we can improve the, the operation, maintenance inspection programs to, to help reduce the overall risk to the site? And then a third option that I show here is looking at risk from a, a job uh, category perspective. So we've listed out some, some work groups that might be present at a typical uh, hydrogen facility. And so this really lets you see if any job is incurring excessive risk um, and make sure that your people are safe. So you wanna make sure that you know, people at locations are safe, but you also make, wanna make sure that no individual you know, job uh, category is, is incurring in, into uh, high risk.
So when it comes to risk mitigation, we've kind of talked about this a, a little bit, but really what you want to focus on is uh, locations incurring the greatest risk and sources contributing the greatest risk. So by spending your time on, on those two groups, you'll really be the most efficient because none of us have a lot of time. We're all really busy. These projects, you know, uh, go uh, really quickly. And so we want to make sure we're spending our time and our energy on, on things that really can make the most different, uh, uh, the, make the most difference. Some high level options, you know, that, that are kind of common practice to reduce risk are listed here. So relocating non-essential personnel further away from your high risk areas, that should be a pretty cost effective uh, uh, mitigation strategy. You also can design or upgrade your buildings that are close to high risk areas to be resilient to the hazards. So whether the hazard is, is jet fires or whether it's explosions, you can design your buildings to be stronger, to be able to, to, to basically take the impacts from those hazards so the people inside are safe. Now, at the end of the day, you know, we want to emphasize release prevention. If you can keep the hydrogen in the pipes, that's going to be uh, that's going to be your best approach. So, what what types of mitigation st uh, strategies around operations, maintenance, inspections can can you do to release the likelihood of a release? And then detection, you know, comes into play. How can you make sure that you detect a potential release or an accidental release as quickly as possible? And then isolation, how do you isolate that release as quickly as possible to make sure that the duration of an event is minimized, to make sure the size of a, of a cloud um, is, is minimized? So these are th things to, to keep in mind when we talk about risk mitigation. Now, at the end of the day, one of the things that I, I will highlight is that if you start safety analyses early in the project life cycle, that's gonna be the most cost-effective way to, uh, to mitigate these hazards. If you wait all the way to the end of, of the process, your, your facility is already built, and then you look at, uh, um, you evaluate the hazards and you try to mitigate the risk, that's gonna be the most costly. So start early in the design phase. And this uh, table here wasn't provided in the white paper uh, series that we issued. However, we published it a few years ago, uh, I think in 2020 at the GCPS. And I really love this, this, uh, this table. Basically, it's a stage gate matrix for different phases of a design in the project life cycle. So it takes you all the way through you know, uh, FEL123, and then into your detailed design, construction, and then operation. And Baker Risk has highlighted some safety studies that uh, would be beneficial at each phase of the project. And by getting these safety studies involved early in the process at these FEL stages, you know, once you're getting into detailed design, that's really going to reduce your capital expenditure when it comes to mitigating the risk and hazards on site. So I, I really love this table. I hope that you know people take a snapshot of this of this slide uh, for use during your capital projects because I think it's a really useful tool and gets you thinking about how to mitigate uh, risk early on and and where it can be the most efficient. Uh, one of the other things I just highlight really quickly is that. Um, I will note that we didn't list out PHAs, HAZOPs, and LOPAs in this table uh, specifically, with the assumption being that those are being done anyways at the different phases. So, so that's kind of expected um, in terms of uh, you know, project life cycle of, of a capital project. Uh, but these other uh, safety studies are really important. So we've gone through a lot of technical information over the course of uh, this last hour. Um, the next few slides are really a, uh, an idea from Baker Risk point of view, from the authors of, our, of these white papers of, of where we see the hydrogen industry going. So on the right hand side of the, the screen here, you'll see uh, probably a, a pretty well known figure from the Department of Energy. Uh, those of you that are in, already involved in the hydrogen space might, might find it familiar. Uh, but one of the key takeaways, you know, from my opinion is that the world is going to go through an energy transition. Some people call it an energy transformation, uh, where in order to be able to meet the energy demands in a low carbon uh, net zero type approach, you have to look at different options beyond you know, what was previously used. In most cases, you know, direct electrification is going to make the most sense. If you can electrify a process, um, and the electricity you're getting is, is produced in a clean way, that's low, no carbon, net zero, uh, then, then you're, you're, you're done. Where hydrogen is really coming to play a role and will play a role is 
industries that are hard to abate. There's a whole range of applications out there that are really different, difficult to directly electrify. You know, we provide a whole list of examples um, in, the, in the white paper. So I encourage you to read it, to go through it, uh, because there's definitely places where uh, hydrogen makes sense and it has these uh, competitive advantages over other low carbon net zero options. And so that's really the one of the important takeaways is that hydrogen by no means is, is the, uh, the be-all, end-all, but definitely has a place in the energy mix moving forward. So this table gives a, gives a high-level view of some of the, the thoughts from Baker Risk side of things and, and the white paper authors. Um, I'm not going to go into them in depth, but I did want to touch on just a couple of them that I feel really find really interesting. So the first two listed here, personal vehicles versus heavy-duty trucking. So if you think about most personal vehicles and heavy duty trucks on the road nowadays, they're, they're run by internal combustion engines, either gasoline or diesel. So in the personal space, we are seeing a slow adoption towards battery electrics. You know, lots of people see Teslas driving around all the time, and we definitely have uh, infrastructure for, for electric vehicle charging that, that's popping up, you know, pretty, uh, pretty extensively, depending on your region of the world. Now, uh, on the flip side of that, you know, hydrogen fuel cell ev electric vehicles, uh, those are also commercially available. You can, you can go out and buy one depending on your region, and you can go to hydrogen fueling stations to, to fill them. Um, but the, the, the widespread um, or adoption of those is, has been much slower and is, is, in my opinion, behind where personal vehicles are. And so you have to look at, well, does a hydrogen vehicle that's for personal uses have a intrinsically, you know, um, a competitive advantage against a battery electric vehicle? You know, if you think it does, well, then maybe then the hydrogen vehicles will, will be able to catch up and surpass battery electric vehicles for the personal category. But if, if you don't see a competitive advantage, then it's probably not likely to be able to catch up or, or surpass battery electric vehicles. Whereas if you look at heavy duty trucking, there are some pretty well documented and well understood competitive, competitive advantages for hydrogen fuel cell trucks. Uh, you know, one of them being the example for recharge time, uh, recharge of a, of a heavy duty electric truck to recharge that battery versus the refueling of a, of a fuel cell vehicle that's a heavy duty truck. You know, so... In some cases, you can see, such as personal vehicles, maybe hydrogen is, is not really going to develop much of a market space. And in other cases, like heavy-duty trucking, you can see how, you know, the life cycle analysis is already showing that, that hydrogen heavy-duty vehicles are likely to be, you know, cheaper than diesel uh, vehicles in the future, never mind uh, battery electric ones. So I hope that the, this, uh, the, the white paper that, that we've published around this industry outlook gives you some insights and, and lets you think about what the, the possible uh, ways that hydrogen will be used in the future and helps you with your day-to-day with your -day operations and, and thoughts for moving forward. One of the other things I really wanted to cover around the hydrogen industry is the, uh, the formation of hubs in the United States. So I know that there's many people online that are not uh, based in the US, but I think this is pertinent to, to people in many regions. Uh, so in terms of background, the P Department of Energy has been soliciting uh, bids to develop hydrogen hubs in the US for the last few years. And uh, just recently, I think maybe it's been about a month, now they, they basically announced the, the, uh, the hydrogen hubs that are gonna be moving forward in this process. So they've selected seven hubs and uh, they have $7 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act to be able to, to help fund these hubs. So seven hubs, $7 billion, it's about a billion dollars each. Now, I don't think that the money is gonna get distributed evenly, but at the end of the day, that's the, that's the average number. And so this is really demonstrating a, a real investment. You know, that's tangible money that's going into these projects. And that the funding from the DOE is not intended to cover the entire project. So we're, we're going to see, you know, 50% uh, to two thirds of the projects being covered by, uh, by corporate private investment. And so if you think about that 7 billion, you know, multiply that by three, $21 billion worth of investment in hydrogen infrastructure in the next few years, this is a really exciting time to be part of, part of the hydrogen economy. And so this is definitely something to keep your eye on in terms of how the hydrogen hubs develop in the US, if you're US based, but also if you're in other regions, uh, because, because this could be you know, uh, a really interesting uh, uh, system that may impact you even, even outside of the US. 
So some of the key takeaways I wanted uh, you to get from this, this uh, webinar uh, are shown up on the slide here. I know we've talked a lot about a whole range of different aspects, but really what we want you to, to do and understand is that you need to evaluate and understand the risk associated with your new hydrogen projects or the expansion of your existing hydrogen operations. You know, it's important to, to understand the, the, the impacts on health, on safety, and, in, and the environment. So these are all key important pieces. And that the earlier, year, earlier excuse me, you get involved in uh, safety, get safety involved in the project life cycle of these capital projects, the, uh, the more cost-effective mitigation strategies are going to be. And so that's really important. I really hope that people in, uh, use that, that uh, stage gate matrix that, that we've developed, because I think it's, it's really applicable and really useful. Additionally, you want to make sure that when you're uh, when you're designing these systems, you're going beyond understanding the high uh, the hydrogen hazards that are just associated with flammability. There's definitely other hazards, you know, high pressure hazards, material compatibility issues that you want to make sure you understand uh, as you develop your systems. And then finally, whenever you're looking to introduce hydrogen into a, a facility, into a new location, you have to make sure that you're, you're understanding the impact of, of that and, the, and the, the hazards that hydrogen imposes on that, those new locations. So, so that might be evaluating the risk to workers, the risk to you know, consumer facing uh, facilities, to, to the people that are coming to fill um, hydrogen at a hydrogen fueling station, you know, making sure that you understand that and that the introduction of these uh, hazards are, are well understood for both the people on site and, and off site. So I want to give a real big thank you to all the, the hydrogen white paper authors. Uh, they're all on here today. Um, so I'll call out their, their names and give them a quick introduction. So Darren Malik authored two of our white papers, the, the hydrogen as an energy vector and uh, the past and future test programs for hydrogen. Murtaza Gandhi issued uh, white paper number two, Hydrogen Analyzing Its Hazards. And then Dr. Sean Berg wrote the Material and Damage Mechanisms paper uh, for us. White paper number four, Hydrogen Facility Siting and Risk Analysis, had three white paper authors. So our lead author was Fika Adelia, and then her co-authors, Josh Bruce Black and, and Mike Moose Miller. Matt Edel was able to author the high pressure hazards um, associated with hydrogen white paper. And then Michaela Dresendorfer was the author of white paper number seven, hydrogen leading into the future of an industry outlook. So all the content from today's webinar and the whole white paper series was not possible without these authors. You know, big thank you. They did a great job, I think. Uh, and the, the data and information that they've shared with us is, is really valuable. I, and I hope you find it valuable as well. So. How can we help? Well, I hope that we've already helped you a little bit uh, with this, this webinar. I know that uh, we went through a lot of information uh, rather quickly, but uh, hopefully you have a better understanding of the, the hazards associated with, with uh, hydrogen systems and how to mitigate them. Um, if you have more questions, I think we'll have a few minutes here at the end. Uh, I'll be able to answer questions. And uh, if you want more in-depth support, you know, Baker Risk hosts uh, uh, Baker Risk Learning Center courses on hydrogen hazards and safety. So we'd be more than happy to, to uh, teach you on a more one-on-one -on -one type, uh, type effort, as well as if you have questions about any of the services or safety studies that we mentioned during this uh, webinar, we'd be uh, more than happy to, to cover those. So thank you for everybody for the time. And if there is any questions, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Peter. And I'm going to go ahead and ask some of the questions that came up during the presentation. And then just as a reminder, if attendees haven't already done so, we ask that you type your questions into the Q&A box in your control panel. So, uh, Peter, first question that came up was, will the hazard differ if the electrolyzer is outside versus inside the building? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, if you have electrolyzers inside or outside of the building, the hazards are going to be pretty uh, similar, but um, the consequences of an accidental release are going to be quite different. So if you can imagine an accidental release from, from an electrolyzer that is outdoors, uh, you can get a dispersion, you can get a flammable cloud, you can get a flash fire, jet fire, you can get a resulting explosion. If you have an electrolyzer inside of a building, that dispersion can then accumulate inside of that building and you get, get 
potentially a much larger flammable volume, fl uh, flammable cloud develop. And so if you have an ignition of that cloud, you can get a much worse um, uh, vapor cloud explosion and, and, and blast hazard. Uh, but but that's, a, that's a good question, very interesting one. Perfect. And so another one is if I have a package electrolyzer that I purchase, do I need to do a PHA on it? Yeah, that's an interesting one because I can definitely see um, a situation where uh, you're you're buying a patch, package analyzer and you, you want to stick it into your new facility. Um, and I would say definitely you need to do a, a PHA. Um, there's various ways that a uh, hydrogen uh, electrolyzer package can integrate with the rest of the system. And so if you were just to, you know, do a, a PHA, you know, on just that package itself, you might be missing how that package interacts with, with other systems. And so that really goes back to kind of what we talked about in the uh, in the web webinar actually earlier, where you have to understand the scope and the, the limits and if you if you're doing the PHA properly, um, it will include how that package interacts with other uh, with other systems. Good question. Okay, another one is: Is there any rule of thumb in designing hydrogen facilities to minimize potential risk? Yeah, yeah, that that's a great question. You know, I think um, that brings in the idea of inherently safer design. Um, there, you know. There's a whole range of different strategies that you can take to, you know, make a system, a facility, you know, more inherently safe. Um, and I think that, you know, Baker Risk has learned a lot over the years uh, in these different various hydrogen projects to, to make uh, facilities safer. And so definitely there are some rules of thumb, you know, that are related to equipment spacing, to location of personnel, uh, to how operations are done for your high risk uh operations. So for example, if you're doing loading or unloading, typically you're going to have, you're going to be making and breaking those connections. So any operation that involves making and breaking a lot of connections, depending on your number of loading and loading operations, that's probably going to be a risk driver. So really focusing on, on the equipment and operations with those types of things are really important. There's also, you know, flammable gas detection, isolation. Uh, if you have indoor processes, best practices for um, ventilation, uh, making sure you can minimize, you know, your hazards. So definitely there's good rules of thumb, but there's too many to, to kind of list off here in this one place. Thank you for that answer. Um, someone else has asked, how can I lower the risk of a hydrogen facility? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a good question. So so I think that goes back to the similar kind of question that we were just talking about in terms of inherently safer design. The first step is really understanding where your where your risk is coming from. So that is both from uh, the qualitative standpoint and, and PHAs and, and the quantitative standpoint doing a risk analysis. And so once you have a better understanding of your risk profile, you can focus in on uh, your high risk uh, uh, sources. So what's contributing the most risk and your high risk locations uh, which are basically process areas or buildings with, with people that are incurring the risk. So if you can focus in on those two aspects, then uh, then you can make your, uh, your facility less risky. Perfect. And so another question is, if my company has done a facility siting for a hydrogen facility, can I use the result for a different facility that is very similar? That That's a great one. Um, so I think that... Uh, that's an interesting question because as we see the hydrogen economy grow, uh, there's definitely the potential for very similar facilities to, to pop up uh, in different regions. So whether that's fueling stations or hydrogen production facilities, you know, if you're, say, an, an EPC firm, you could use a very similar process and layout for a facility at multiple locations if, if the end goal is the same. Um, however, there are a lot of uh, facility and site-specific characteristics that are important. So, for example, um, weather conditions, uh, receptors that are off-site, ignition sources that might be off-site, the physical layout, uh, process conditions, all of those are variables that, that might differ from a site to site, even though you have, you know, in general, it's it's the same. But when you get into the details, there are a lot of differences. So I, I would caution that uh, if you want to use the same risk analysis, you would have to be very, very careful because you could definitely underestimate the risk uh, if you're just copying pasting uh, from one location to another. 
Great. And then this is going to be uh, the last question before we conclude this presentation. Um, does high pressure hydrogen require special construction materials for protective barricades or enclosures? Yeah, that, that, that's a good one. So um, I, I mentioned uh, and kind of went over some mitigation strategies for, for high pressure hydrogen during the, the webinar. And so um, I think that the most important thing is to understand the, the hazard and the, the potential impact. You don't necessarily need to use a, a special, you know, uh, uh, materials. You, know, you can use, you know, concrete and steel, you know, that, that could be fine. But it just needs to be engineered to be able to take the forces that, that's, uh, that the projectile hazard or the blast hazards are going to be um, uh, producing on that uh, on that um, uh, protective system. So so definitely you can use typical construction materials, but it just has to be engineered to be able to take uh, whatever hazard that you're evaluating. Perfect. And it looks like we've only covered a few of the questions that we were asked today, Peter. So to the audience, if you have additional questions, we ask that you reach out to Peter directly. Um, and we know there are some that were also typed in the Q&A box. So Peter's going to answer those questions and send via email to everyone that attended and weren't able to attend but registered. Um, and that email will have answers to those questions with the links to the recorded webinar and slide from his presentation today. So thank you so much, Peter. It was very well done and great information. Well, thank you uh, for having me and thank you for, for watching my web webinar. I hope everybody found it useful. Hope you have a yeah. good rest of your day. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. And as a final reminder, today's webinar, like we said, is going to be posted to our Baker Risk website. Uh, once the recording is available, you'll receive that email from Baker Risk or Peter with that link. So again, we ask that you complete the survey at the conclusion of this. And thanks for joining us today.